Welcome to African Catholic Voices, brothers and sisters. Today is a special day for us, special day for our continent, a special day for the Catholic Church in the world, and a special day uh, for one of our own, His Eminence Francis Cardinal Arinze, who is celebrating 90 years, 90 years, I repeat, of life here on earth a life filled with so many accomplishments and so many significant milestones, both for him and for the church and the world. So our conversation partner is Francis Cardinal Arinze, and I know your eminence, that you don't need any introduction, but if someone may ask, who is Francis Cardinal Arinze? How will you talk about yourself? Which is a big challenge, you know, because uh, you're not used to talking about yourself, but uh, people like to know about your life, your the highs and lows of your life, and um, how you got to be this man of the church, uh, well-known throughout the world, and a source of inspiration to so many people. Your Eminence. Thank you, Father Stan. It depends on what you and our hearers would want to know, if I can tell. My name is Francis Arenze. My hometown is Eziowele in Anambra State of Nigeria. I was born on November 1, 1932, and my parents belong to African traditional religion. That was the normal religion of most people at that time. I went to school. My father sent me to school as he sent my other brothers and sisters. Then in the school, we learned also about the Christian faith, and we became Christians. I was baptized by Father Cyprian Michael Iwene Tansi on November 1, 1941. That's the Father Tansi who later on became a monk and was beatified by St. John Paul II at Oba on nature in 1998. I was a boy like all the boys around. <clears throat> we went to school, the Catholic school at Ezeole, then at Umudioka, Dunukofia. My headmaster was the famous Pierre Keke, who later became Minister of Agriculture in Eastern Nigeria. So like all the boys, I went on in school. Then I desired to be a priest because Father Tansi at that time was such a priest that the boys who were near him, especially those who served mass, many of them wanted to be like him. To cut a long story short, I entered the seminary in 1947, junior seminary. After four years there, having done the Cambridge School Certificate with success, I was assigned to teach in that seminary. We call it prefecting so that the young priest-to-be also gets into touch with reality, working. Finally, I went on to philosophy in 1953, Bigard Memorial Seminary, Enugu, when that seminary was two or three years old. To cut a long story short, in 1955, I was sent to Rome where I did theological studies for five years. Within that period then, towards the end, I was ordained priest in 1958, finished my studies with doctorate in December 1960. Back to Nigeria, I was appointed to teach in Bigard Memorial Seminary, Enugu. That means where the students who want to be priests are trained in philosophy and theology. 
I was the first Nigerian priest to be appointed. The rest of the staff were Irish missionary priests. Before I finished two years there, I was transferred to be Regional Catholic Education Secretary for Eastern Nigeria, resident in Enugu Diocese. The bishop then was Bishop Anyogu in Enugu. The Archbishop was Archbishop Charles Siri at Onicha. That was on, within that period, Bishop Anyogu sent me to London to do a one-year diploma course in education in the London Institute of Education. That completed back home in 1964. I continued as education secretary, except that the following year, I was made bishop to assist Archbishop Charles Erie at Onicha. That was 1965, and then the Archbishop died two years later, and I was made Archbishop. Then the Nigerian Civil War began two days after I was declared Archbishop. Hmm. You can imagine what the war years could have meant, but I, I leave to the rest to your interest on what you would want to know. After that civil war, <clears throat> the work was reconstruction all over, especially the eastern part of Nigeria that had been called Biafra. And then I continued in that. The bishops' conference took on life. It was already beginning all around the world after the Second Vatican Council. I was blessed as bishop because I attended the council at the last session in 1965, two weeks after I was ordained bishop. So I was the last bishop in the Vatican II sessions. Then that was that. Work never was lacking. In the bishop's conference, I had various assignments till I was also made president of the conference in 1979. Gradually then came the big year, 1982. Pope John Paul II visited Nigeria, a lot of work, mm -hmm. and then, and joy. Two years later, he called me to Rome, to the Office for Interreligious Dialogue. I was in that office for 18 years. Mm -hmm. And then after that, he transferred me to the office for worship. We called it Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments. Until 2008, when I reached the canonical age to retire, that means 75 years. Since then, I am still in Rome. When we reach the world, the age 80, cardinals and bishops are no longer members of various councils because it is, it is more human if they reach that age to leave them free. They may be in wheelchair or in the hospital if they are not in the cemetery, then they are left free to <laughs> use their day as they think best. So that's where we are. This is the person talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so wonderful, Your Eminence, hearing your story and your very fertile memory, how you recall everything that happened so succinctly uh, and clearly. And, um, you know, I was with you. I visited you uh, for dinner in Rome and you were looking so healthy and fresh. You're not using a walking stick. You are very, very um, uh, strong in every sense of the word. And I don't know, I mean, we ate together. You eat the same food like the rest of us. And what is the secret of your enduring youthfulness and energy that you might share with uh, 
some of us because some of us priests and bishops who are not even half your your years are already some are suffering from one problem or the other uh, arthritis uh, and all kinds of health issues uh, you you appear to have uh, something special uh, health wise don't you think so your eminence well when i think of those of my age i have reasons to thank god the question of health we have to go carefully part explanation is how god made each person so some people in the way they are made only doctors may give an explanation some people remain more or less healthy all their years of earthly pilgrimage then listening to the doctor and to general rules of health and regularity of life some people more other people less for the rest we simply have to accept that we all cannot be of the same physical frame when you met me you you probably you thought i don't use walking stick that was because we were sitting in the room at that time <laughs> you also may not know that even arthritis does not spare cardinals <laughs> nevertheless i have many reasons to thank god for giving me good health because i know that some of my age don't have it as easy if i may use that word as i do have so we praise god with what we have and if we cannot be at athletic and useful and we are not able to jump around at every age we have to learn to accept reality and to live with it the main thing is use the body god gave you with care and what comes we accept thank you your eminence we will now pause for a special song, uh, Happy Birthday, to be rendered by the Immaculate Heart of Mary sister. Eminence, hooray at 90, hooray at 90. Oh, be joyful, oh, be jubilant, put your sorrow far away. Gaudeyamus, 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 hotia. Happy birthday, Candy Malarinzi. Happy birthday. We are saying we love you. May God be with you till the end of the time. We are saying we love you. Happy birthday, Kadima Larinze. Happy birthday. We are saying we love you. May God be with you till the end of the time. We are saying we love you.
On the 90th anniversary of your birth, Francis Cardinal Arenze, I felicitate with you and thank God who has sustained you in good health of mind and body. It is indeed a privilege for me to send you these words and prayers. I count myself as your spiritual child on two counts. First, I received the sacrament of confirmation through your hands in the year 1972 at Immaculate Heart Parish, Oga. There are thousands of us who have received this sacrament through you in the vast territory that was Onisha Archdiocese. I therefore congratulate you on behalf of all of them. Second, as the Bishop of Ebulobe Diocese, one of the three dioceses created out of the Archdiocese you administered, I inherited many institutions and processes put in place by you and your collaborators. When I review these, I see the personal wisdom that informed them. I also marvel at your energy, drive, and commitment that enabled you to attend to your varied responsibilities. What you oversaw as one archdiocese has given birth to four particular churches and the old ecclesiastical province you were metropolitan archbishop of has given birth to two other provinces one wonders how you succeeded in attending to the tasks of your office especially in the challenging post-war situation in Igbo land made more complex by the first exit of the missionaries. Despite the devastation of war, the near collapse of whatever infrastructure there was, and the air of despair hanging over the people, you rekindled hope, built up the faith, and contributed to the post-war rebuilding of the people. You labored tirelessly and left marks of goodness for all of us to follow. We thank God who achieved all these through you and we thank you for making yourself available and cooperating with grace to the glory of God. Once more, on behalf of all your spiritual sons and daughters, I say happy birthday as you age gracefully. In union of prayers and thanksgiving to God, I remain your son, Peter Eberi Cardinal of Malika, Bishop of Ebola of Diocese. Nigeria. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. And um, we know that God is the source and foundation of all things. But I remember when you preached to us in the seminary uh, in 1989, you reminded us about John Vianney. You know, he he wasn't very brilliant in uh, theological education, 
But then you said not everyone will be John Vianney, <laughs> so that each and every one of us should work hard to study and not say, well, John Vianney wasn't that brilliant uh, and eventually made it to become a saint. So this aspect of what God gives us, uh, nature, and then our own effort, which you emphasize. So in your daily routine, um, what is it, uh, what's life like, your daily routine, and whether this daily routine is actually contributing to the health of mind, body, soul, and spirit? Thank you. Well, the, the routine of everyone has to be arranged according to the duties and state of life. Now that I do not go to a fixed office every day, I rise about 5.30 in the morning, personal prayer in the chapel at six o'clock, lords with the community, we are four in the community at 6.30, followed by Holy Mass, so that by 7.15, our Mass is over, personal prayer, breakfast at 7.30, then each of us goes to our daily work. Now that I am not going to a fixed office, I decide what I will do each day. Mm -hmm. I have plenty of things to read or to write or to think about. Mm -hmm. In case I have no appoint some appointment, somebody we fix he would come at nine or ten or eleven or twelve. Otherwise, later on towards eleven o'clock, I have one hour in the chapel. But divine office. Holy Scripture, and other sacred reading. Then there's time for lunch at towards one o'clock, some rest after lunch, and more of the uh, walk in which along the passageway on the op in the open, so mm -hmm. I can say my rosary and pray also the litany of God's mercy, and then more reading, at some stage, listening to the television, the news for the day. And then in the evening, we have Vespers before seven o'clock, then supper. And after that, more reading. I generally go to bed about 10 o'clock at night or a little before. You may think that I am studying right up to midnight. Not really. Nevertheless, students, many students cannot be persuaded not to stay, overstay in the evening. Mm -hmm. I suppose that one secret is fidelity to a steady program, not overloading, whether in eating or sleeping or in times of study so that the body is not overworked. The students who don't study enough, you mentioned St. John Mary Vianney in the beginning, the students who don't study enough or those who do their sleeping in class during lectures, <laughs> they should not put St. John Mary Vianney as their patron because he worked hard, but he couldn't score high marks like Thomas Aquinas or Einstein. If those students want a patron, I will give, tell them their patron. It is Eutychus, that young man, I think Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, who was sleeping when St. Paul was preaching the whole night. St. Paul <laughs> had the tendency of speaking right along. And this Eutychus fell from the first floor down and died. He is the patron of the students who sleep in class. <laughs> <laughs> but the curé of worked hard. He couldn't pass exams, but the rector of his seminary and the bishop were wise enough to realize that this particular young man is gifted with wisdom by God and love of God and love of souls, and that therefore 
he could function well as a priest. And so he did. So these are the various things that we do. The next, uh, one other element that helps very much is another human being who helps us. God made us with a social nature. Since I was the ordained priest, I have not lived alone. I have always lived with another priest or many more, except one year or two when I was education secretary. So it is always a blessing. I have a priest, you can call him secretary, but he is much more than that because we discuss. I bounce my ideas against his own ideas and what comes out is better because when reality is complex and nobody sees all the sides of reality, when you have an idea, when you write a script, when you write a, a homily, not to talk of a booklet of 70 pages, it mm -hmm. all looks perfect to you until you give it to another person. So the priests who assess me in that way have also a great role in what people say that I did. Many things, therefore, that I wrote are not just my idea, but also product of many other people who contributed, some in one way, another in another. It's very interesting what a human being can see in what another has proposed or written or said. Everyone can contribute. It's surprising so that at the end, the product is better. In all these ways, we strive to do what we can. Then we leave the rest to God mm -hmm. because prayer is acting as if everything comes from God, but that same God wants us to do our part. Perhaps this answers some of the points you raised. Yes, yes, very much, uh, Your Eminence. The uh, fascinating thing is how you maintain this discipline that you, you, you mentioned and fidelity to a pattern of life and um, trying to strike a balance, not overloading the system. And then the sense of community uh, is amazing that someone with your high intellect and experience that you are humble enough to also affirm an important lesson that you're giving us that people should bounce their ideas against the ideas of others. Uh, like the Igbo say, if a kulifa could be So something, everything stands uh, alongside the other. And this is a very important message that you give us your commitment to community life. Because many people say uh, that there is a challenge in modern times because of digital system of uh, isolation, loneliness, and um, people actually become disconnected from community, not through a conscious uh, decision, but because of the imprisonment to social media. These channels, can actually become uh, another form of uh, social space or interaction that works against uh, intimate connection between priests among religious and between priests and the, their community. But you are calling us to return to this sense of community. And uh, I'd like to draw you more on that. Uh, how can priests and religious, those who are in pastoral work, how can they increase um, and they enrich their lives through this sense of community that you just uh, mentioned to us? What would be your advice? They will have to begin by accepting that God made us with a social nature. None of us can become all that that person can become without another. You cannot reach the height of your potential without another person. Symbolic is the 
a human being born as a baby, that baby needs everybody in order to become what the baby can become. So also in life, when we are alone, we see only one angle. Another person may be of a different intellectual caliber, but that person has something to contribute. There is nobody who has nothing to contribute except the one who is not willing or the one whose contribution is not accepted. Even uh, no, nobody is always wrong. Even a person considered not clever. A clock that doesn't move is even correct two times a day without realizing that it clocked <laughs> correctly. Which means that we shouldn't write anybody off because how an angle from which a person sees a point is very important. If priests, therefore, you mentioned, were two or three in a parish and they walk together, if they would only sit, maybe at their supper, they don't have to have formal sessions, but they listen to one another. They discuss the apostolate. Each one sees the joys, the sorrows, the angle, his own, um, how he approaches the situation. Another contributes. The end result is better for them individually and for the parish. And you can apply the same to other people. They may be medical doctors, they may be professors, they may be nurses, they may be social workers, whoever they be. So we human beings need other human beings in order to become all we can become. Community life is therefore a positive thing, but it needs the conviction of each person and the contribution of that person. Then the person can grow. Thank you very much, uh, Your Eminence. And just uh, talking about uh, the works that you do, uh, many people point to the uh, depth of your homilies, uh, your speeches. I was quite impressed. You know, I sent you an email and in less than eight, eight uh, hours, I got a reply. And you do all these. So how can people respond this quickly? Because including myself who is talking, some people will send me emails and then it takes days because then when they say, I, say, I am busy. So we hear some of us clergy uh, saying we are busy. So we don't respond to emails and some people, priests, uh, bishops or religious, you say, ah, why haven't you written a pastoral? You say, I I'm busy. It looks like uh, people in our times, your remnants, we are busier. Like maybe in your own time when you when you produced, uh, you produced a lot of works, including even when we were growing up, we read a lot you wrote every time you're producing. Uh, but now uh, some of us are no longer <laughs> producing because it seems that life today is busier than uh, during your time. So uh, what keeps you going and what is it that you might recommend to uh, priests and bishops and religious today that can help us to uh, respond quickly to emails and secondly, to write books? Uh, like uh, like you, I just, you gave me three of your your books. Uh, you have a book on prayer, and um, these are very important resources. But uh, who is going to be the next Cardinal Arinze writing like you have written? So, what lessons uh, do you think uh, people can um, learn from your own practice? Well, everybody is different with the opportunities God gives, with the possibilities, with the surrounding situation. Obviously now, if I answered your email immediately, perhaps I have less engagement than the normal bishop. A diocesan bishop has very many more engagements than I have. 
So in that case, it may not be that I am better than he, but that I have less work. If I were still a diocesan bishop, I might have had more difficulty in answering you immediately. That's one explanation. But there's another explanation. Many people, they undertake too much. They should learn to share their work. Maybe a parish priest, a bishop, a director of an institute, maybe a, a lecturer, maybe a, an agricultural expert, maybe head of other office. They have to learn what is it that others can do or should do so that I don't have to do the whole thing myself. I have to learn to share. If you are the director of an office, you learn to delegate and then look into what your assistants have contributed from time to time. In that way, by better organization, you can keep your calm and at the end, you can produce more. You, you mentioned some of the things I've written. You notice that they are not big books like those produced by professors, those that run into 500 pages, <laughs> but they are generally booklets. <laughs> so each one has to undertake what he is able to handle and not pretend to be Thomas Aquinas or Einstein. Uh -huh. uh, so that is also the case. But no matter what we do, I come back to that idea of other human beings who love you, who want you to succeed, and who are there for ready to read what you have prepared and to give you their suggestions. They are very precious. Every author of a book knows that. So mm -hmm. that's what I can say in this case. Then for the rest, have an ordered life, an ordered day, and have clear plans and targets. And do not undertake many things which are not essential to your mm -hmm. calling. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, much, Your Eminence. So we are celebrating your 90th birthday. And if someone asked, what do you consider the secret of your successful life? Because uh, people, everyone um, looking at your very, very significant uh, life, the milestones will say, he lived and lives a successful life. So. What are the secrets that you want to share with uh, the world? No great <laughs> secret, really. Beyond, you know, some of those ideas I've suggested already. That St. Augustine says that God made us without our cooperation, but he will not save us without our cooperation. So each of us has initial gifts from God, but God wants us to use those gifts. And there are people who can help us, but they will not help us if we are not willing, if we are not requesting them, if we are not grateful for their remarks, especially when they disagree. If you are not able to accept someone saying to you, you did not do well on that point, if you will listen, if you will be humble, if you will be thankful, then you will get more of such helps and you will become better. So for the rest, it is simply each one look into yourself, get your friends to give you suggestion, positive and negative. Let your friends not praise everything you do. Let them tell you the thing as they see it. That's what I would suggest. Nothing that is a big secret. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. And end, yes, please. Uh, sorry, Your Eminence, if you still have something to add to that question. Uh, no, okay. it, it is simply if the individual at the end is willing to accept reality, if you will not want to be exactly like the other person, if you will not argue that if this person got a doctorate, 
you also must get a doctorate. If you will not compare and contrast yourself with your neighbor, and you want to shine beyond and better than there, these are the things that do damage to a person. Accept reality as it is. Beg God to help you to see reality and help you, beg your friends to help you to see mm-hmm. reality mm-hmm. and not to live in a, in a dream. That's what I would suggest. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. It's so true what you're saying. Someone uh, described humility as someone who does not think too much of himself or herself or too less of himself or herself, but who accepts reality that what God has given is enough. And on that note, uh, looking at your life, you're quite fulfilled and um, at peace, very um, joyful is so evident in your life. As a young boy growing up in Eziowele, Igbo land in Eastern Nigeria, uh, did you ever dream that you will become a cardinal, a prefect of uh, the congregation for the discipline um, of sacred worship and discipline of the sacraments and uh, that you will sit uh, in this uh, altar chair at St. Peter's Basilica for the closing of the Special Assembly for Africa and many other milestones. The, was that your dream uh, that you are living now? It was not my dream. A boy who would have such a dream would not be normal. <laughs> we would have to call psychologists to examine that boy. He would not be a normal. No, a boy is a boy. And when I was a boy, I just did what other boys did. We went to school. The most I desired finishing school primary was to enter the seminary because I admired the father Tansi and I wanted to be like him. That was within the boundary of my dream. Did, did I know at that time what a cardinal is? I did not know. And there was no need for me to know. And God who made us, he made us in such a way that we don't have to know what will happen to us in future. So he knows that. So our part is to do what we have to do today and to leave to him our tomorrow. He looks after that. What would we think of a child held in the mother's arms If the child is thinking, what will happen to me when I finish primary school? Will my parents be able to pay for me in the secondary school? And will I be able to get into a reputable university? And after that, shall I get to work? Mm -hmm. If a boy thinks like that, a baby, the baby is abnormal. So let's pray to our father, give us this day our daily bread, not give us this day, our bread for two years' time <laughs> because we have a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Your, your Eminence. And uh, we, we can't leave you without asking uh, two more. Question one uh, is at uh, 90, uh, are there things you look back and you you regret that it didn't happen in your life or in the life of your people, the things that make that made you sad, um, that when you remember, whether in the life of uh, God's people, the life of the world, um, because we're now coming to the end where you will give us blessing and make a wish for, for the world and... Um, but as you look back, are there anything that happened uh, in your life or in the ministry or to God's people that um, made you feel very sad? Everyone in life, looking back, will have such regrets. Some we are ready to discuss with everyone. Others we might regard as personal between us and God. Looking back, I cannot forget the suffering of the people 
during the Nigeria Biafra War. And I was just made their archbishop two days before. Mm -hmm. Suffering in many forms, as you can imagine, hunger, homelessness, death, violence. But also, I remember such things as a priest not doing his work, abandoning his calling. One happened in our part of Nigeria after that civil war. But also, I have beautiful memories, events. How can I forget my baptism there? The day I was ordained priest in Rome in 1958, 23rd December, uh, November, by a Cardinal Gajanian, whose cause of beatification is now on. How can I forget the people's generosity to me all the years I was made bishop? And even now, when I go on holidays, I say mass for them in a parish on Sunday, and they think immediately to give me yams, to give me maybe a fowl, sometimes an animal on four feet, <laughs> and the so, isn't all this reason for us to be glad? And then when I see models of priests, religious, cardinals, bishops, popes performing beautifully, are these not reasons for joy? There are so many things that make us joyful in life. When I look at my own personal life, there are events that make me sad. When I think I was a young bishop, now I re reflect perhaps I was too hard on some people. I should have been more kind to them. And there are many other points which will go into my prayer before the Lord, but not between two of us. Father, <laughs> Father. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Reminence. Uh, it's, it's wonderful listening to you and uh, learning how you process uh, information that shows a deep spirituality, but also a sober mind that is able to make this discernment that you make, but also the humility to admit that um, you are also, like uh, Shakespeare said, frail creatures are we all. To, to be the best is the fewest faults to have. And Augustine says that all things human is imperfect. We live in an imperfect world, but God always shows us the light. And uh, through you, we have seen um, flickers of the divine light through your life and uh, your ministry. And we thank you. And as we come to the end of this conversation to celebrate your 90th birthday, we ask you to make a wish and then to bless the people listening. Yeah, give us your birthday blessing after you have made a wish. Uh, it can be anything. I mean, you've done this for the last 89 years, so your reverence, you're able to share with us your wish for yourself, for God's people, the church, and the world. For you and all our listeners and those who will see this program, my prayer is that the Lord may give you joy, peace, grace, that internal calm of mind and heart, which only God can give, that God may give you greater clarity of what he wants you to do or not to do, that your days may be fulfilled in joy, that your sleep may come because you are not over worried about things of this world, because you realize that although God wants us to do our part, his part is very necessary and he never abandons us. So may each of you find peace and joy and fulfillment and also have the grace to accept the reality in what you like and what you don't like. 
because in life, we don't get only what we want. So I pray for all of you. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Your Eminence, brothers and sisters. It has been a special episode to celebrate Francis Cardinal Arinze as he turns 90. We thank you, Your Eminence, for your life, your faithful and consistent witness to the gospel, your services to God and the, the church and the world. And the second part of this conversation will come up again next week. Next week, brothers and sisters, His Eminence Francis Cardinal Arinze will look at the Second Vatican Council. He participated towards the end of the council and um, he lived through the council and lived through four popes now, and uh, I should say five from John, Paul, John the 23rd, Pope Paul the sixth, um, Pope uh, John Paul the first, Pope John Paul the second, Pope Benedict the sixteenth, and now Pope Francis. So you will have a lot to share with us as you watch the church grow from that time when you were appointed bishop to now. Until next week, brothers and sisters, when we share with you the wisdom of Francis Cardinal Arinze, we ask you to be strong in your faith, to be fervent and faithful in loving, to be courageous in hope, Take care of your life, the beautiful life that God has given you. And take care of your brothers and sisters. Love your neighbors. And take care of this beautiful earth that God has given us. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>